good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Palouš. I am director of uh, Václav Havel program for human rights and diplomacy at Florida International University. And this is a part of our project we are working on together with Inspire America Foundation, whose director, uh, Marcel Felipe, is going to not only participate in this uh, panel discussion, but help me to uh, moderate uh, uh, our exchanges. Uh, the basic intention of uh, Ideas for Cuba is to uh, give voice to listen to Cuban democratic opposition and uh, especially strengthen their voice internationally uh, so that they can participate in the debate about Cuba's future and finally hope that democracy and freedom will be brought uh, to their lovely island. Uh, global pandemics uh, is uh, certainly affecting our activities. That's why we have this uh, form of communication. It affects Cuban population as well. And we would love to give to these people voices uh, that uh, they can participate in this important debate. Uh, technically, uh, it is not uh, easy to bring them here. Uh, there will be no one uh, participating directly in this conversation. But uh, Inspire America Foundation has tried to do its best to bring their voices here. Uh, so I would pass it now to Marcel and ask him uh, to um, make a couple of introductory remarks himself and maybe allow us to listen to what is the message from Cuba. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, there's really a, a global pandemic that's affecting the entire world as we know it. Uh, however, there is specific um, nuances when it comes to societies such as China, North Korea, or Cuba, where there isn't a complete uh, transparency from the part of the government. Uh, and those cases require special attention to be able to understand the impacts on that population and the available mechanism to be able to aid that population. Um, it is because of the particular nature of Cuban government and their history with transparency, that it's so important for independent voices to also be heard, independent experts uh, in Cuba to be heard. Um, one of the things that we were trying to do uh, here today, and unfortunately, technology has made it very difficult, is to try to get some of independent voices from Cuba to, to give us uh, their perspective. Um, but the issues were in part um, specifically medical and substantive. Um, in the case of Cuba, uh, what is the likelihood of the the impact of of this uh, virus? For example, you know we've heard a lot of discussion about the uh, hotter temperatures perhaps being something that attenuates the impact of the virus. And we're coming into summer, and Cuba is a particularly hot country. On the other hand, you have um, a, a country where earlier this year, before any um, public awareness, let's call it, of the virus in early January there was a huge shortage and a decision made by the government not to buy sanitary products. You're talking about a communist government where that means that there's not a free market. It depends what the government buys and puts on the store shelves. And the government decided specifically not to buy sanitary products in an, in an effort to get more um, oil and other uh, basic supplies. So in, in that context, um, you know, it should worsen the situation. You know, the heat might, might make it better. Um, we're getting new data from places like the Czech Republic, th uh, China, that public mandatory public use of masks, even if they're not BN95 masks, may have an effect. So a little bit of that discussion in the context of what we can expect in Cuba, I think, is one of the main topics that uh, would be fruitful to get from this. The second um, uh, topic uh, here is uh, how to get um, aid to what is the best way to get aid to the, the Cuban uh, people. Uh, we have seen a history on the part of this government to a not allow aid to come in except through its own channels, but we've also seen a well-documented history of the government um, reselling the aid that is provided or re-gifting the aid to other countries, um, making it so that it's it's quite an issue. And in fact, um, you know, the third and related subject is how this impacts uh, U.S. policy. 
um, U.S. policy right now is uh, definitely under attack, not just by the Cuban government, but it's um, but the folks that basically promote uh, the Cuban government's point of view that the embargo should be completely lifted. Uh, the embargo has specific provisions in it for humanitarian aid and for medical uh, supplies, uh, so it really shouldn't be an issue. But we see that the government is already um, definitely. Uh, starting to do these things. So those are the concepts, one of the, the, the issues and the uh, concerns to be discussed with our experts today. We wanted to begin by a very well-known voice from Cuba, uh, Dr. Bissett, a medical doctor who was a Nobel Prize nominee and the U.S. Presidential Medal uh, winner, um, someone who was well-known and in prison for his work on um, criticizing the Cuban uh, health system and uh, spent quite a bit of time in, in prison. So he sent us something from Cuba, which I believe uh, we have now and our, our host can, can play it and screen share it for us. Buenas, Embajador Martin Palos, del Centro Javier de la Universidad Internacional de la Florida. Doctor Marcel Felipe, Presidente de la Fundación Inspire América. Distinguidas personalidades e invitados. Les habla el Dr. Oscar Elías Vicente de Cuba. Soy especialista en medicina interna y profesor de la misma especialidad. Laboré en el Sistema Nacional de Salud de Cuba durante 12 años, desde 1986 hasta principios de 1998, cuando el régimen de Cuba tronchó mi carrera médica por exponerle la realidad sobre casos de crímenes de genocidios en la medicina cubana. Al comandante Fidel Castro hice saber de un trabajo investigativo sobre el asesinato de niños nacidos vivos después de un aborto tardío en los hospitales de Cuba, cuyo título es Ribanón, un método para destruir la vida. La respuesta del comandante Castro no se hizo esperar y a los pocos días fui encarcelado provisionalmente y bajo interrogatorios y amenazas para que me retractara de la acusación. Esta situación represiva por parte del régimen castrista conllevó no solo a la pérdida de mi ejercicio profesional como médico, sino que la represión se proyectó sobre mi familia. A mi esposa, la licenciada Elsa Morejón, la chantajearon los miembros del Partido Comunista del Policlínico de expulsarla de su trabajo y su casa, el domicilio del consultorio médico, si no se divorciaba de mí y me echara de la vivienda. La enfermera Elsa mantuvo una actitud digna por su amor a la humanidad, la verdad y a su esposo, y los comunistas cumplieron sus amenazas, la desemplearon y se alojaron de su hogar. Por eso, cuando supe que profesionales de salud en China fueron amenazados por publicar la epidemia de la anomalía de Wuhan, e incluso el médico Li Wenlian recibió esas amenazas por la policía y días posteriores misteriosamente murió del mismo proceso infeccioso. Recordé ese modus operandi. Ese tipo de proceso represivo de la policía política lo he recibido yo en Cuba. Fidel Castro, por los medios de difusión, me atacó e hizo un falso diagnóstico de salud de mi persona. Esto le permitió a la policía política que me trasladaran al hospital psiquiátrico de La Habana, lugar tristemente célebre, donde a las personas por disentir políticamente del régimen les habían aplicado electrochoque. Más de una centena de esos casos de uso de la medicina como torturas tiene registrada la Sociedad Psiquiátrica de la Florida. Y gracias a la lucha persistente de mi esposa Elsa y los médicos de esa organización de psiquiatría impidieron tal atropello criminal. Existen otros intentos del régimen castrista para asesinarme, pero hoy estoy con ustedes para expresar mi preocupación sobre la pandemia de COVID-19 y su mal trabajo en Cuba. La falta de libertad y la desidia son combinaciones perfectas para la dictadura totalitaria de Cuba, pues oculta las elevadas cifras de enfermos y muertos dentro de la población cubana por la pandemia de la COVID-19. El gobierno cubano está utilizando las mismas estrategias políticas de censura realizadas cuando la dramática situación de explosión del reactor nuclear de Chernobyl o la recién crisis epidémica de salud en Wuhan. En realidad, 
los cubanos necesitamos un cambio profundo hacia la libertad y la democracia bajo el amparo de la constitución de 1940 y el apoyo de ustedes para acelerar ese tránsito y con urgencia la vigilancia y denuncia y así poder evitar lamentables situaciones y grandes pérdidas de vidas humanas en esta pandemia. Muchas gracias. So that's the message from Dr. Bissett, uh, done under a lot of difficulty given the technical situations in, in Havana. Uh, and I think we've outlined the issues for our experts. I turn it back to Martin so we can take it from there. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bissett, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Marcel Felipe, for uh, uh, your interventions. Uh, now it's my uh, honor and pleasure uh, to welcome and introduce the four members of our distinguished panel that uh, hopefully help us to uh, enlighten us uh, and clarify the issues important in this conversation. First of all, we have here uh, Dr. Ellen Marty, infection disease expert and professor at uh, Florida International University's Herbert Wertheim's uh, College of Medicine. We have here also uh, Dr. Pedro Caro, Uh, he is medical doctor, original hematologist uh, from Cuba, uh, now living in the United States and is uh, board certified in general practice here in this country. Then we have uh, Maria Verlau. Maria Verlau is the co-founder and executive director of Cuba Archive, uh, following the uh, Cuban events really from a very close and important perspective. And the last but not least, we have uh, Miguel Angel Martinez uh, Melchi, Professor of Political uh, Studies at University uh, Austral de Chile, but he is of Venezuelan background, so he will bring his input uh, from that perspective because obviously regional context is also a very important concern uh, we should take into consideration. But first of all, I would like to start with Professor Marti and ask her to give us her uh, uh, perspective bringing us to broader uh, context of pandemic crisis. Hi, this is Dr. Marty. Thank you so much, Martin. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and share some slides to give you all a, a kind of a broad overview of what we know about this virus that we really only learned existed about four months ago and where we are uh, in the world on this particular issue. So the classification of this virus, it belongs to a group, an order of viruses called the nidoviralis group. It's a very interesting group because they have a strange way of reproducing. They, they have a nested set and that, that nido is from the, from the Latin word for nest because of the way their genetics are. And so there's a whole group of different types of viruses that fall into this nested set of reproduction, which is one of the biggest problems that we have with creating a vaccine or even treating people with this virus as it belongs to this group. And if you notice over here on the far right, there is a member of the same group that is found in insects, but we've never found any member of the coronavirus group that's in insects. We divide it into alpha, beta, delta, and gamma coronaviruses. Those are genuses. And what we're looking at here specifically is the a beta coronavirus of this uh, subgenus called the Sarbo coronavirus. And th that includes the SARS virus of 2002, and that has many flavors, as well as this new SARS virus of COVID-2, which is the one that causes uh, COVID-19. And notice that the MERS virus, which was a big problem starting in 2012 and caused a big outbreak in Korea uh, in, in uh, 2015, which is, by the way, why the Koreans had a much better response to COVID-19 than almost any other country, because they were warned by what happened to them with MERS back in 2015. But, but it belongs to a, a distinctive different subgroup. So What do we know about where this came from? We know that it's most closely related to a virus found in the horseshoe bat, which has this funny nose, it looks like a horseshoe, and that hence the name. But the reality is that there was actually one piece of feces with one particular version of virus from one particular horseshoe bat that's almost identical to the COVID-19 virus. It's 97% the same. And that's the specimen called RATG13. 
It's a single species found in one particular cave. If you look here, so here is the SARS virus and there's two flavors of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's causing COVID-19. And you can see that absolutely the closest relative is this bat virus. And MERS is way far away from the SARS and the SARS-2 virus. And here is the cave, uh, the same distance as from here to, from Miami to New York, to get to Hubei province. So it's a big distance that we're still seeing the same virus. The virus binds into our cells with a spike protein. And this version of the spike protein was reproduced by uh, Romy Amaro, uh, actually a relative of mine, who is studying how the spike protein interacts with the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 receptor in humans is actually almost identical to the ACE2 receptor in felines, that means cats. So we've seen domestic cats that are sick with COVID. They have had respiratory symptoms and diarrhea. And now, of course, the big publicized problem in tigers and lions in the Bronx. Ferrets, the ACE2 receptor is almost identical. Macaque monkeys, chimps, and we think other animals as well, which is a huge issue if we're going to control this virus particularly since ferrets seem to be able to replicate the virus and not, um, and not get sick. They're like asymptomatic carriers. So we know that on the 16th of March was the first day that the rest of the world had more cases than China. That was a month ago almost. Where are we now? We've gone from 168,000 cases worldwide to over 2 million cases today. And, uh, and, and, the, and we're still climbing. In terms of what's going on in the world, we are still climbing. And we're often saying how the US has many more cases than anywhere else. I just wanna point out to you that the number of cases in the United States is less than the total number of cases in Europe. And that the case fatality rate in the United States is currently 4.4, which is higher than the case fatality rate than they had in China but lots lower than the case fatality rate that we're seeing in Europe, where they are seeing a, a 9.8 case fatality rate. Of course, we had a little more time to get ready than the, than the Europeans did as, as their major outbreak certainly started before ours did in Northern Italy, uh, where it started for them. That's, that's where we are today, and that's what's going on. If we look at data from PAHO and we study what's going on in the Americas, um, we see that most of the cases in the Americas that are known, and that's an important point, are in the United States, as are most of the confirmed deaths. The current statistics for Cuba officially are 766 cases with 21 deaths. That's where we are, and that's what's going on. Uh, important aspects of this disease is the fact that the virus is stable in a lot of environmental situations, including being stable as an aerosol if somebody coughs it out, right? And it can be, uh, the secretions can, the virus can be grown, not just the RT-PCR found, but the actual culturing out and showing that the virus is alive for at least three hours as an aerosol if you don't have negative pressure to get it out of the room. It's present for at least four days in undiluted urine, uh, in diarrhea stool as well, and up to nine days in suspension, uh, up to 60 hours in plain old water or soil. It's perfectly alive. And, uh, and then on a variety of surfaces, we've seen that plastic, so there was a move by some grocery stores to say, don't use reusable uh, sacks for your, for your uh, groceries. That's a bad idea because the virus lasts longer on those plastic bags than it does on the, uh, the fabric bags that you can wash in the laundry, okay? And uh, it can last six days still alive in a dried state. It's gonna last longer and for more days and more time when it comes out in spit or in a cough or in diarrhea because those products have stabilizers that let the virus live for longer periods of time in more surfaces. Here's just a higher view of some of the things that were studied. And you can see that in plastic, it can last up to 72 hours. Um, so that's something that definitely has to be wiped off. On the flip side, 
uh, 15 minutes in, on ethanol will kill that virus. Soap and water removes it completely from your hands. So that's, that's a uh, household bleach in five minutes will eliminate it um, and other substances as well. It's also sensitive to high heat, 140 degrees Fahrenheit um, and uh, to UV radiation as well. One of the important things people aren't taking into consideration, and it's super important, is what's the infectious dose? In other words, how many plaque forming units do you have to get into your body at a given time to manifest disease? And we talk about an infectious dose 10, that's the certain number of particles that if 10% of the population, that if, uh, if everyone sees it, 10% would get sick. 50, uh, an infectious dose 50 is that amount of virus that if the whole population, 50% of us would get sick and so forth. And uh, obviously at 100 uh, infectious dose, everybody would get sick if you had that much of a bolus because the dose makes the poison in everything in life, including pathogens such as this virus. So for SARS-1, uh, the infectious dose 50 was about 100 to 150 um, viral plaque forming units. And for this virus, it's looking like it's only 90. So, it, so at 90 plaque forming units entering a body is 50% of the people that get that much virus in them in one bolus are likely to show symptoms. If you get a smaller bolus, you may just become a subclinical case or an asymptomatic case. Uh, and when you present is gonna be different depending on what bolus of virus gets into your body at a given time. One thing that's now been established for this virus is the reality that there's a serial interval that's lower than it was for SARS. It's about four days, but it can be, it can be less days if, you, if your intake was of a higher infectious dose, right? Or it can be higher at it, that serial interval if your bolus was a smaller than the standard infectious dose 50. But generally, it's averaging about four days. And for SARS, the original SARS, it caused, it took about seven days for people to shed enough virus to make somebody else sick. So that's what the serial interval is. And that's different than the infectious dose. Uh, excuse me, that's different than the incubation period. So the incubation period is, is between the time that your body confronts an, uh, an infectious dose and when you start to show symptoms. So the average, the average person shows symptoms about five days. So you see vir virtually everyone has at least a 24 hour window of being pre-symptomatic. And we know for a fact that there are many people who never become symptomatic and are still shedding virus. And those things combine to make this a really rapidly moving target. And we know everybody's seen these graphs before. What, how, how much higher the outbreak would be if we employ no public health measures versus the various public health measures that we employ that bring down the total number of cases and slow down uh, the input of patients into hospitals, which is so important. So that's what we're talking about. But of all the places that have done it and, and been able to get to the other side of the curve, and we, nobody in the Americas is on the other side of the curve. Everybody in the Americas is still going up, including the United States and Cuba. But the countries that have managed to get to the other side of the curve have done it from testing. Testing and isolating, test and isolate. And it doesn't, and unlike what we've been doing here in the United States, and I understand Ron DeSantis just authorized changing that, thank goodness, We've only been testing symptomatic people. And according to the CDC, we were still only authorized to test severely uh, ill people. That's a huge error. It's a huge mistake. You have to test every contact of every person that is positive and isolate those individuals separately from everybody else, not leave them in the same household, unless, of course, we're talking about a child or somebody who's physically unable to take care of themselves. But as long as a person is physically able to take care of themselves, they should be in a completely separate unit than and everyone else, unless the unit they're in has other COVID-19 positive individuals, which is an issue for uh, places like institutions uh, such as um, jails and so forth. If everybody in that particular cell is positive and has a low grade response, they can stay together, but if there's one positive, they may not be around people 
people who are negative or you will spread and you will continue this and you will never flatten the curve. So the issue is to get the reproductive number below one. So we talk about the R naught, which is the reproductive number um, without making any changes to what happens in nature. And if you look at the reproductive number without any changes conducted by us, without any public health measures, China's original measurements were about four. And what does that mean? That means that each person infected will likely cause disease in four other people. 3.9 was their actual number. And we have to get it below one. So what are the features of that reproductive number? One is the duration of the infectious period. How long is somebody infectious? The next is the opportunity or contact rate. So the duration of the infectious period for this virus averages 10 days. If we can shorten the number of days, we can re help reduce the reproductive number. The second thing is the number of people or surfaces you come in contact with. That's the contact rate or opportunity for getting infected. And that's very closely aligned to the transmission probability, which is a little bit different because if, the, if you're near 10 people and only one is positive, that's different than if you're near 10 people and seven are positive, right? So what is the transmission probability? Also has to do with how close you get to that person who is positive. Are you within six feet for more than 15 minutes, for example? Are they shedding a lot of virus? In other words, are they coughing? Or are they just sitting there silently? Or are they speaking and letting out viral particles as they speak? Those are all the factors in the transmission probability. And the last is the one I've been emphasizing so much for the population, which is susceptibility probability. What can we do as individuals to make ourselves a yucky host, something unpleasant to the virus? And, those, and that's your wellness factor. So you see, again, it's been about two to four. We've gotten it down in this country to a little bit over two which is much better than the four that was originally pre present before any public health measures. When you recognize these things, to decrease the duration of, of the infectious period, we need either drugs or vaccines, neither of which we have, all of which we're doing a tremendous amount of work to create. But there is no way right now to decrease the duration of the infectious period. But we can decrease the opportunity for contact and we can decrease the transmission probability. And the features that decrease those are what we've been employing, and, they, and they're both interrelated. So limiting the size of mass gatherings, limiting the time near an infectious person, hand hygiene, body hygiene, room hygiene, proper use of uh, personal protective equipment, negative pressure rooms, uh, and this thing that we have to do, which is testing the contacts of every single positive patient. One of the things we've added to this is the use of masks for everyone because of the high rate of asymptomatic transmission so that I may not know that I'm harboring virus. I feel perfectly great, but I go out there and I could be contaminating the world. So when I'm outside, I need to be wearing a mask. Um, and of course, uh, the, you know, uh, we have to look at some of the burial methods. We're not looking at that too well yet. That's an issue that's for the future. I've already mentioned there's an issue with animals since the January WHO has been telling everyone do not have pets near a COVID positive person. Uh, it's been largely ignored throughout the world and that's a huge problem because as we know there is mechanical and possibly uh, amplified transmission through, through animals. And of course in terms of susceptibility we mean healthy living, right? exercise, proper sleep, proper nutrition, eating good healthy food in appropriate quantities, not too much, not too little, not junk food, good variable diet. Exercise is absolutely imperative. It's part of a way of decreasing stress, which is very important. Uh, so make yourself happy, tell jokes, those things um, uh, lower your, your, your cortisols and increase your uh, endorphins and enkephalins, which are very, very good. And of course, if you have a comorbidity, we absolutely want those comorbidities to be um, uh, in best possible condition, so they have to be treated, and we don't yet have a vaccine. But the goal, again, is to get that reproductive number before, below one. If the reproductive number is below one, we can go back to normal society.
That's the bottom line. And that's why we need to do it. Um, this is just sort of the presentation that has been shown to be uh, true throughout the world that about 80% of cases are either mild or moderate. By moderate, we mean a walking pneumonia. It's really very miserable for the people that have it. Um, some people have severe, some have critical disease, and that has shown to be true in the United States. And those are all the slides I really wanted to share with you today. Uh, I have a lot more material that goes into the details of how to treat the patients. But I think that if you have this kind of understanding of what the issues are and how we can get to the other side of the curve and bring the reproductive number below one, I think that, that um, that's the most important message for this conversation. Any questions? Dr. Marte, thank you very much for this uh, really concise introduction. Maybe a question uh, will come later, but uh, let me do, uh, go right away uh, to Dr. Caro who uh, is Cuban, so he knows Cuban situation uh, from his personal uh, experience. And obviously, what was coming to my mind when I was listening to the advices uh, that you are giving to people how to help uh, us uh, to lower all these uh, limits, uh, uh, is it quite difficult uh, to achieve these goals if you have a society with a shortage of everything, uh, including soap, uh, and uh, uh, if you want to suggest to people that they should have a balanced and healthy uh, food, uh, it might be uh, for some uh, societies a uh, pretty complicated thing. But anyways, please, Dr. Caro, it's your turn now. Okay. Uh, the first one I want to let know that um, um, the health system in Cuba created a protocol for management, outpatient and inpatient in all cases um, and deal with this situation in, in Cuba. As outpatient, um, I think it's very similar following the recommendations all around the world. The only difference is that they uh, cases who has been in contact with another person with COVID virus, fake patients in that they suspect that uh, has the disease or they have a possible uh, disease and person who arrive to the country are isolated in, in some places. It's the only difference in this protocol. I don't know if Dr. Martin had the possibility uh, to check this protocol. I think it's a very good protocol. And they, uh, once the patient has symptoms, the patient is admitted in the hospital. They don't follow the patient as outpatient. And they usually, uh, uh, or they have included in the protocol, um, medication, natural problems, homeopathic uh, problems, problems. And they treat the patient with antivirals, including in some part of the protocol, they use interferon. And they classify, once the patient is in the hospital, they classify uh, the patient as per health status, and they apply a treatment with antivirals, antibiotics, uh, antagonists of the uh, interleukin. It, it, I think it's a good protocol. The problem is the capacity to compliance with uh, in this situation because from the economical point of view, I think if they have too many cases, it will be very difficult, uh, you know, uh, it really ha have compliance and resolve the problem. But they have good experience from the epidemiological point of view. In Cuba, I know there are very, very good doctors because I know uh, too many doctors in Cuba. And I would like that Dr. Martin check this uh, protocol because something may be uh, controversial, no? And it would be a good idea that they check it and give uh, the opinion 
about um, this protocol. So uh, this is uh, maybe uh, from the side of uh, um, experts uh, and science uh, in the area of uh, medicine. Uh, I would laugh, and I think it's very important, that the whole thing is uh, put into a political context because there can be a very uh, uh, general and fundamental thesis formulated uh, certain uh, uh, political situations maybe are more uh, capable to, by making mistakes, uh, adapting uh, themselves to the changing circumstances, correcting themselves in the context of open debates uh, to come up uh, to uh, some sort of uh, better and better solution. We hope that the solution does exist, but uh, certain political systems are uh, and I'm afraid that Cuba might uh, fall into this category, uh, are trying to do something else uh, uh, instead of serving first its population, how to deal with uh, these challenges. So I would ask uh, Maria Velao, uh, she's not a doctor, uh, she's a uh, historian, political scientist, uh, to give us her perspective, because I think that it will be uh, such a different one. Maria. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I do have a question that I will leave on the table for the expert, and is uh, is Cuba really using interferon um, as as it's part of the protocol because they're exporting it and uh, taking the opportunity of sending teams of doctors overseas with a package deal with the interferon that has been sold to the world as a wonder cure. We're coming out with a whole piece on that. Um, so I have the question because in none of the um, reports by the Ministry of Health in Cuba, is there any mention of the use of interferon as the supposed uh, effectiveness of this drug in treating the disease? And the second question is, um, for those of you looking at the statistics of fatality rates and stuff, um, it's interesting you know, I, there's no way to know, I think, if Cuba is reporting the actual cases because they have a long history of censorship of public health statistics. So it's hard to know if the fatality rate indeed is so low. Um, you know, 21 out of 770 something doesn't seem like a lot compared to other countries. So that raises some attention. But um, to go into you know, my perspective of this and the analysis of the situation in Cuba, we have just come out with part two of a four part series on coronavirus in Cuba. And this particular part is called Coronavirus in Cuba, A Perfect Storm. And why did we call it a perfect storm? And it's because there is a conjunction of factors that make this a very explosive and dangerous situation internally for the population. And I think for the, for the um, um, succession, for the regime itself. Number one, of course, is a very impoverished population to confront a quarantine. Um, people in Cuba, the average monthly wage in Cuba is the equivalent of $42. The pensions are 9 to $12. And this is a month, not a day. It's a month. The, um, the minimum wage is something like $16. And the ration book, the, the subsidized basket, food basket that the government guarantees years ago was not enough according to even official economists to cover 14 days of the month. So most of the Cuban population does not really have enough to eat. Their diet already is a problem to face the disease. And then of course, we don't have the drugstores and well-stocked supermarkets, even for people who have remittances, which is a considerable part of the population, although certainly not 50%. Uh, to go stuck up on hand sanitizer, vitamins, whatever people need uh, to face a quarantine. Uh, then there is, of course, the situation that people need to line up. And in, in, in these crowds, you know, for this is fertile ground for the spread of the virus. Then we have shortages recognized by the government of soap, of hygiene products, detergent, um, toothpaste. I mean, this is a very difficult situation and it's unsanitary to, to, to contain the spread of the virus. And to live in a house where there's most of the homes don't have air conditioning 
uh, and it's getting hotter in Cuba. They don't have access to Wi-Fi. They don't have computers. They don't have cable TV. They only have the stations that the government proposes. So it's a very explosive situation to confront a quarantine that in itself is difficult in, deve in the developed world. Um, then you have a serious problem uh, with water service where the, even the government recognized officially on television that they had half a million people in the city of Havana without water service. And this is all throughout the country. There's no water service in some of the medical facilities and some of the hospitals, certainly not in schools, although now they're closed. So, but a lot of homes have um, the problem with water. So that not just contributes to the frustration of the population, but also is unsanitary and proposes problems for contagion. Then you have a population that 20.1% of the Cuban population is above age 60, which is the most vulnerable to the virus, as we know. Uh, we have a situation of medical apartheid when most of the population has access to medical facilities that are in very poor condition, filthy, they don't even have sheets, you know, the bathrooms. I mean, there's a lot of pictures on the internet and social media on this. We just posted in our series, if you go to cubasalud.org, we posted some photographs of this that are coming out right now in Cuba of the condition of the places where people have to go on, on the quarantines, on the forced quarantines because they've been in contact with someone with the virus. This is including health professionals and some of the hospitals. Um, this is a very difficult situation where usually before the coronavirus, there in Cuba were not basic medical supplies and medication. And now you have a questionable number of respirators, of ICU equipment, et cetera, that is needed. Uh, then you have the situation that is uh, an enigma for me. Is there really enough medical staff in Cuba to confront this? Uh, Cuba reports having 95,000 doctors today, which is 20,000 more than 10 years ago. However, we understand that most of these doctors have been sent overseas as part of the brigades, but they also report a huge decline in the number of nurses and of technicians. So the, I, I think it's 28% in 10 years that has, there's been a decline in the overall um, medical staff in Cuba. This is, as Cuba has sent medical personnel to 18 countries already in the last month. Um, and most of these people are nurses, which is where they're lacking. And you know, we know the amount of attention and the toll this has on health workers. So that's a big concern. And then uh, we have a situation where the government is technically bankrupt and this economy is parasitic. It depends from the um, external sources like Venezuela. And we have the demise of the support from Venezuela. We have Cuba locked out of credit markets many decades ago because they don't pay. And then the restructuring that they did, they haven't met. So Cuba has no access to markets and no way to compete for already a shortage of medical supplies in the world. And now we have a whole world in need. So donations and assistance to Cuba are going to be less than if Cuba were the only country facing a disaster or an, or an emergency. So um, that in, in a nutshell is why I believe this is a perfect storm. Maria, thank you very much for this very important uh, contribution to the debate. I think that the confrontation between uh, two perspectives, on the one side, uh, epidemiology, on the other side, description of economic and political realities, that's uh, maybe key issue uh, in the whole debate. And uh, from here, I think the question, what can we do, what can be done in this context, really can start. So. I would like now to go uh, to Professor uh, Miguel Angel Martinez uh, Melsi, uh, who hopefully will able to bring us a uh, regional perspective uh, because uh, maybe Venezuela, the closest partner in Cuba in that respect, also is experiencing uh, the same situation and it might be some similarities uh, between these two countries in the current moment. Um. Thank you, Professor Parlos. Uh, thank you, everybody, for allowing me to participate in this panel. 
Uh, well, yes, I am Venezuelan, uh, also, also living here in Chile the last four years. But uh, my research line is about the Venezuelan political situation. I am political scientist, and I, I should say that the the situation in Venezuela right now is is similar to the one that was being described by uh, Dr. Berlau in Cuba in many things. In as much the political system of domination um, installed by the Chavista government is very similar. Uh, to the one that is being used in, in Cuba. So um, the problem right now is that Venezuela was uh, already living a complex humanitarian crisis. So this crisis is uh, getting uh, worse right now where, with the um, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, there are huge differences between the um, numbers that the show this, the official statistics and what some independent media have been saying. Uh, for example, the, currently the number of uh, infected people is about 200 only. And they are told, uh, taking about um, nine, only nine dead people. So, but we are all thinking about many more, much people, many more people uh, infected and the situation is especially bad because we are suffering uh, the lack of water, the lack of medicines, medical supplies in the hospital, in the hospitals. The current situation in the hospital is awful. So uh, if we were already living uh, a disaster in the situation of, the, um, of public health and private health, uh, the situation is expected to get uh, worse in the next uh, few weeks. So, uh, um, nonetheless, this, the situation is already being uh, used by the Chavista government to take uh, wider control over the population. For example, uh, Guaido, President Guaido was um, planning to mobilize many, many people during the current weeks. But uh, the government of Maduro is uh, taking advantage of this situation to uh, um, use the quarantines to keep all the people in their homes. So uh, the, the situation is also being taken, is, is also being used by the government to uh, uh, punish to threaten many political figures that are trying to connect the people to organize uh, a protest uh, all over the country and uh, well we can see that the situation right now is um, uh, one of the uh, huge um, concern about the the situation of our leaders and the people who cannot um, get access to to health programs uh, we are also suffering the problem of the fuel the gasoline uh, venezuela which is an oil country oil producer country is now producing uh, no much uh, more oil about 600,000 barrels a day is the current uh, production in venezuela and this is uh, suffering also the impact of uh, international and especially U.S. sanctions. So, uh, for example, we see that the, the Russian enterprises, oil companies that were working in Venezuela are now being punished uh, and the um, situation in the refineries is really awful. So, uh, in this moment, we can see that Venezuelan don't have access, access even to the gasoline. So, uh, we are uh, Mm, seeing many protests that are starting to erupt in Venezuela uh, from people who is asking for the access to the gasoline. Because the problem is that in a destroyed economy, such as the Venezuelan one, the people cannot even get um, food, cannot even move to, uh, to get food. So it's uh, also, I, we should say that this a uh, uh, a perfect storm situation. Um, 
Well, uh, what can be, can be done in this situation? Some sectors, political and social sectors, are asking for a kind of agreement between Maduro and Guaido, between uh, Chavista and opposition sectors, in order to get access to um, uh, international uh, financing to uh, protect uh, and to help uh, the medical system in Venezuela to offer a better um, response to the crisis uh, of the pandemic. But the problem is that uh, so far we cannot see it, uh, as possible that kind of cooperation. I think there is no, any, no interest in political actors to get uh, to settle this kind of agreement, because uh, uh, as we have seen right now, uh, the crisis is useful for the Chavista government to control the people. And uh, it's also useful to endorse a narrative of uh, foreign blockade uh, against the sanctions of the US and also the European Union and Canada and other countries. So uh, I think um, as a conclusion of all the situation that the, um, the crisis is being really useful for the government uh, while the people is not uh, angry enough to protest. So, uh, that's it, that the, the government is using the crisis to control population. And if we don't see any kind of uh, huge protests uh, of the population. This is going to be useful for uh, improve to in deep this, uh, this control over the population. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, intervention. I still would love to give to all of you at least once more an opportunity to react uh, to what you have uh, heard from your partners in this discussion. Uh, but let me to say this, it seems to me that uh, speaking in general terms, we are here operating in a triangle with three tops. Uh, science is on the one of them, uh, and I think that the case was made here pretty clearly. But on the other side, we have economics, uh, we have uh, uh, the state of uh, societies, what they can afford and what they cannot afford, but most important in my view is the third top of this triangle, which is politics. Because obviously the most important weapon uh, to fight against virus is, I would say, positive response of the population, uh, the willingness that their participation in the process makes sense. Uh, and it seems to me that democratic participation is uh, the most important condition for the success. And in both cases, Cuba and Venezuela, I don't see that. And obviously then the question is, what should be the international response to that situation? What other countries can do for individuals in Cuba suffering and in Venezuela suffering the current situation to help them, but at the same time to help them to start a political process. So uh, I see uh, uh, Dr. Marte already um, uh, trying to raise her uh, hand, uh, but maybe go ahead. Can I go ahead? Uh, I, th I, I think what we're talking about are repressive, oppressive regimes, horrible places to live. But I have to, I have to point out the obvious, and that is, it is as horrible to be under an oppressive right wing as it is to be an oppressive left wing. Shouldn't we also consider what's happening in Brazil? That's my provocative question to you. Yes. I, if I may, and, and uh, I think that is a, the, the, the generic question, I think is very, very valid. And it's always one that comes up whenever you address the issue of dictatorship in one place um, because if you address it, for example, in uh, Chile's Pinochet, the question always comes, well, what about Cuba? And if you address it in the case of Cuba, well, it'll always come up with, what about Chile's Pinochet, or, or in this case, as the doctors pointed out, in, in Brazil. 
having said that, um, when you go into um, you know, Brazil had elections, and you can talk about different issues as to uh, an imperfect democracy in, in Brazil. But there's always in the field of political science a difference between authoritarian regimes, which may be pseudo democratic or democratic, and totalitarian regimes. Uh, an authoritarian regime wants to control your actions, a totalitarian regime wants to control your thoughts and change your society from the ground up. So there is a, a qualitative difference really between Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and the traditional Latin American uh, dictatorships. Uh, and I use those examples because it could be totalitarian from the right or from the left and authoritarian. Um, but I wanted to actually ask Dr. Marty a, a more specific question because um, my main um, objective in, in participating is to try to learn specific concrete things that we can do uh, in the case of Cuba. And um, before I ask the question, I, want, I do want to give you an overview that will help you in, in I think, in, in answering the question. And it's taking up a little bit on, on uh, Maria Warlau's uh, points. Uh, in January, uh, we were at Columbia University with a panel of economists discussing how, as a result of the Cuban medical brigades being having their contracts canceled uh, in many different places, the Cuban economy, that's the number one source of income, had about a 60% drop. So you have an economic system uh, or an economic reality that was already harsh to begin with, and now you really don't have people uh, who can stock up on anything, so you will have the lines, and there's a shortage, so you will continuously have the lines. So social distancing is really not a viable option with which we can expect compliance because you actually have to live, you know, eat food to be able to survive. Um, the same issue with hygiene. The government made a decision as a result of that to cut off the purchasing of sanitary products um, to buy oil products. Uh, you know, in early January. So now there will be a catch up and again, no money, no access to credit for the same reasons that she stated. Um, the, when you go to foreign aid, then you have two, a compounding issue. One is everyone's in need. Second, um, you know, there's a very clear and documented uh, history of the Cuban government reselling the aid or taking the aid. And I remember in the, uh, one of the recent hurricanes, the chief complaint is uh, they had donated a whole bunch of uh, mattresses and they ended up in tourism uh, hotel, tourist hotels. Uh, so there is an issue of, um, from international organizations, serious international organizations of saying, if we were going to do this, we would like to be able to operate independently. And the government saying, no, in fact, the, our, our archbishop here in, in South Florida specifically said that they had offered to send a number of food because they had offered to send uh, monetary aid and the local church had said, no, well, we can't do anything with the money. We need the actual items. And uh, the Cuban government said, no, you can't send the actual items, send them the money. And through us, we take a commission, we'll buy it in the international market. So there's a difficulty uh, because you don't have a government that's willing to, or has been a, a trusted partner in distributing aid without taking a, a substantial cut. And then when they distribute the aid, they sell it to the, to the victims of the catastrophe. So, you know, getting aid is going to be a challenge. Um, it's not the uh, lifting the embargo, the American embargo, um, if, even if you agreed with that, isn't going to resolve uh, much um, simply because the embargo already has uh, exceptions for medical and for humanitarian aid. So there's no restriction there, um, no practical restriction. So. My question is, the only thing that I can see that we can communicate as, a, as an NGO to, to the people, we do have channels of communication, so we could, even though it's still very, very hard, we do have the ability to at least inform and educate, um, much, which by the way is a great service because another one of the big issues is the communication. The Cuban government, since it's number one source of income, it's its medical brigades, it's not going, it's not likely to report truthfully uh, because how can you sell medical help if you had one of the highest you know fatality rates in in the hemisphere so you know there is an incentive not to report certainly not the fatality rates um and and perhaps not the cases so 
you'd have to go back to very low tech homemade solutions. And the only one that really pops up to mind, and I'd like to see if Dr. Marty has any other um, uh, ideas, are the homemade masks. We've heard from Czech Republic and uh, Japan where, um, you know, a lot of the, and this is you touched on this, you know, uh, early on we had some, I don't want to call it disinformation, but sort of half uh, truths in that, well, the, N the only thing that would protect you is the N95. Perhaps the N95 mask will, are the only things that fully protect you, but obviously any kind of protection is good. And if you implement a policy, uh, whether at the, you know, through you know, public communication and directly through the government, because, uh, you know, as much as the Cuban government and I are always on opposite ends of everything, I would very much like for them to pick up on this webinar, which they're surely going to listen to, and say, you know what, that's not a good idea. Let's start having everybody wear homemade face masks. Because as you said, it's not so much to keep you from getting infected, but if everyone's wearing it, then it is much more effective in keeping uh, an asymptomatic person from spreading it. So uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that particular strategy or any other strategies that a low tech, impoverished country, um, not just one with a totalitarian regime, but any um, impoverished country, which there's many in our hemisphere, can, can adopt. Also, so I've been a, I have been a big advocate of, my, of uh, <clears throat> masks for all for quite a few weeks now, precisely for the reason that you say. Um, it's something any household can create uh, easily without much in the way of recourse. And I know that in Cuba, they have pieces of material that can be turned into masks. The Cuban people are an ingenious people by nature. And so they, they find a way to resolve those kinds of problems. Um, the hygiene problem with the lack of soap is a huge I issue for them, uh, particularly with uh, the spread to the environment. And I don't know of any easy solution other than um, somehow getting soap into their hands. Um, the, the, the government of Cuba uh, falsely or truly prides itself on its uh, capabilities in terms of molecular biology and uh, medical studies in general. So there is no real reason why they couldn't test their population and, um, and that that would contribute to decreasing the outbreak. Of course, we're asking a totalitarian regime that we don't trust to isolate people based on medicine as opposed to political ideology, and that's a slippery slope. But in theory, if they actually cared about their people, they would in fact do the contact testing of any positive patient, and that means every member of the household, and then find safe ways to isolate individuals that can be isolated. And, and I, I'm not sure how we could enforce their doing that in a humanitarian, safe, effective, and non-political way. Very well. So I think that I'm just watching time. Uh, we need uh, to uh, wrap it up. So first, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Caro, uh, who was following patiently the whole discussion, uh, to make his final comments, and then Maria Verlau will be the last one, and then I will tell you goodbye. Dr. Caro. Yes. No, there is one known what she was uh, talking about, and, and those are in difficulties who will be uh, in, in making uh, create the difficulties to compliance with this protocol of uh, treatment. No, no doubt. And but um, what I was uh, explain, explaining was um, the protocol and how they are managing this problem and um, it's something very interesting to be checked and read and try to follow how uh, it functions if uh, they will be able to control the situation. Yes. Okay. Uh, Maria, your turn. Yes, thank you. Actually, to respond to Dr. Marty's uh, remark. I think the Cuban regime for 60 years, 61 years has demonstrated that it does not care about its people. 
It cares about staying in power. And sadly, it's exported uh, its model to Venezuela. And we're seeing the terrible consequences of that. Um, so I want to just uh, finish by saying what can be done. That's a very difficult question, very complex. But I think one thing that needs to be done is for the world to understand the dystopia that there is between the image and the perception of Cuba as a world humanitarian and a wonderful medical power with the reality on the ground. And I think, you know, all we have to fight this gigantic disinformation propaganda and influence apparatus to put out the truth about Cuba because that will help bring about eventually um, the end of the dictatorship in Venezuela, in Cuba, and the other places where they want to export this. And if the people can exercise their sovereignty and their, their um, fundamental human rights that have been denied in all aspects of their lives, then they will be in a better shape to uh, confront not just this emergency, but all others. And have you know, a chance for prosperity and stability. Uh, I would like to uh, thank to all of you uh, in this uh, interesting debate. Uh, um, it's obviously only a start. Uh, nowhere in the world has, uh, people can say we have done it. Uh, we are still in the middle of that situation. And certainly what Marcel Felipe said in the beginning, uh, the question what can we do uh, for Cubans and Venezuelans, what kind of humanitarian action would really be effective and uh, certainly uh, at least uh, partially following the advices uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Marty on the uh, hygienic uh, side of things. Uh, I would like to promise to you that we will be uh, going on with these communications. We will try as much as possible uh, to bring the voices uh, of independent Cubans not certainly trying to silence the government, that's not our um, uh, intention, but to have a balanced and uh, rational dialogue based on realities and not ideological constructions. So thank you very much. And I see Dr. Marty wants to say something. Yes, um, my question is to Maria because I totally agree with what you're saying, but I don't see the tool. I don't see the tool for doing what you're asking. We need to almost find a way to shame the government into doing what they must do to help protect their citizens. Perhaps we need to strategize on, on, a, on a different way of bringing the message that you have, that you're stating. Um, and so that it crystallizes in the world because they have done this amazing propaganda of, you know, positioning themselves as if they're something they're not. Um, and I can tell you many personal experiences I've had throughout the world um, interacting with Cubans that have been sent by the, uh, the Cuban government and, and exactly how I've watched it operate. So um, I would love to see your message lifted, but we've got to figure out how. And so far, I'm not hearing the how. So if, if we can figure that out, I think we'd get a lot further along. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful invitation to continue the conversation. I'd be delighted. Thank you very much. Based on where we are in the pandemic, there's really no, no time that will realistically get to the point of shaming the, the Cuban government into doing something or to uh, change the narrative that they've created over such a long time with so much resources. I think what we can do to help the Cuban population today is focus on things like this homemade solution, homemade masks, and have everyone start uh, to use it. Uh, and it's a low-tech solution. That's something that we could focus on immediately. Um, it might get to the point where the virus will do what we have not been able to do, which is once the, uh, the body bags uh, start piling up, it will be impossible for them to hide the truth. I hope, I sincerely hope that's not the case. I would very much like to prove the Cuban government uh, for what it is, but not at the expense of such uh, catastrophe. So I'd much rather focus on 
homemade mask. I mean, that's the big takeaway that I get to hear today that that could work. So uh, once more, uh, thank uh, very much to all of you. I think that uh, Dr. Marty's question is a key question. And certainly I can assure you that we are trying uh, to contribute uh, to find the right uh, solution. Uh, our intention, that's the spirit of our survival program, is uh, to express solidarity with people, uh, to recognize their dignity. And uh, maybe we have an opportunity now here in this uh, global crisis uh, to make a difference. And we will be trying to make a difference as much as we can in our future uh, programs of this type. And hopefully you will be able to join us again. Thank very much to all of you. And this is the first, uh, but not the last um, uh, opportunity uh, to have this conversation. Thank you very much.